Welcome to Soundtrack Your Life, a podcast about soundtracks, music, and movies. Each episode features a guest and focuses on a specific soundtrack and the personal stories connected to it. Now here's your host, Ryan Pack. This is Soundtrack Your Life. I'm Ryan Pack, and this is a soundtrack podcast where I talk to someone about a soundtrack that they have a connection to. Today, we have John Munson on the podcast. John is a member of Semisonic, Trip Shakespeare, The New Standards, and The Twilight Hours. Uh, his newest project is Munson Hicks Party Supplies, where you can find wherever you stream or buy music. Uh, welcome to the show, John Munson. Thank you, Ryan. Happy to be here with you. Today, instead of focusing on one soundtrack, we're going to talk about all the soundtracks featuring songs from Semisonic. So let's start with the 1996 Rennie Harlan film, The Long Kiss Goodnight. <laughs> oh, man. It's so funny to think about these having this as the focus of this, because I feel like in the, in the 90s, especially, music supervisors started to do this thing where they were just kind of taking whatever contemporary songs they could find. And they, you know, there were probably people at the label that were pimping songs, trying to get them for appearances in films in order to kind of secure funds to do videos and stuff like that. And so these songs just kind of got tacked into, into films in a way that, maybe didn't necessarily support the films in any kind of specific way, you know, didn't have a role to play in story development or something like that. They just kind of sounded like hits of the day, if you know what I'm saying. And I I would say that was definitely the case in Long Kiss Goodnight. And in fact, you know, I was very excited, and as were all us band members to kind of go and see the movie and see how it appeared in the in the film and very disappointed to discover that <laughs> the song fascinating new thing barely barely appeared in the in the movie at all i mean it, i i'm trying to remember if the only place that it appeared was in the credits but i i was at, i went to the theater with my wife to be we, I don't think we were engaged yet. And I, so I was probably trying to impress her. <laughs> it was like, this is my band and we're, we're in movies and stuff like that. And so we went to the, we went to the theater and I was like, surely it's going to be coming up here soon. And, and if it did appear in the movie, it might have been for like three seconds. And then I think it maybe showed up in the credits again. And then, you know, our names kind of flashed up on the credits. And that was kind of, that was about it. But the flip side of it was, you know, we did get money from whoever was, you know, whatever the movie company was that was putting out that picture to make a video that was all about kind of, you know, it was using kind of themes from the, from the movie um, to, to create this video. I think the the uh, conceit was that we were inside a camera in the video <laughs> and kind of looking out through the lens, and it it was uh, it was very goofy. It was one of those things that happens if you're in a band. <laughs> and ironically, that video is how I kind of found your band. Well, then something good came out of that whole thing, you know. <laughs> The video didn't make me want to see the movie. The video wanted me to go pick up the Great Divide. <laughs> well, you know what, and that and that is really awesome. So I shouldn't, I I really shouldn't kind of say that you know nothing really uh, significant came of it. I mean, I don't think the movie was as successful as the you know Warner Brothers who or whoever made it wanted it to be. It didn't seem like it really penetrated the mass consciousness in a way that that it would have needed to, to kind of recoup the, uh, you know, what it took to make it or whatever. But it, it, you know, it, it is funny how it gives you like a little bit more kind of currency. You're in, involved in the conversation of culture makers and that's, and that is cool. And it takes many, many streams to make a, a river and it takes many, many, you know, appearances and people's kind of 
cultural stream in order to penetrate someone's consciousness and make them realize that, hey, I think I, I might like this song or I might like this band. So if it worked for you in that way, then I'm going to say maybe work for some other people and kind of helped our cause forward. I remember distinctly watching like 120 minutes and Matt Finn Hill was talking about how there's this new band called Semisonic and, you know, members of Church Shakespeare were from this band. And I think my sister has uh, the Are You Shakespeareans record on vinyl that was sitting around the house. So I was familiar with that record. Oh, that's cool. I learned about so much music from my, I had an older brother and an older sister and my brother's 12 years older than me and my sister is six years older than me. And, and so, I mean, for me, their musical influence on me, it was just incredibly profound and both their record collections formed me, you know, in terms of my interest in, in popular music for sure. You know, my, my brother, every year he would get, you know, the Beatles' new album would be like there under the Christmas tree, you know, for him. And and um, and so that uh, those records were so important to me. And then when he left home, I moved into his room and he left a lot of records up there in his room, the ones that the kind of cast offs or stuff that wasn't, you know, he didn't have room for in his dorm or whatever. And. And those became my records, and I just listened to them over and over and over again. Yeah, I had the bonus of my sister actually going into the music industry. She did some A&R work for a handful of years. So, you know, on top of getting access to her record collection, she was just sending me, you know, albums from the label. Oh, that is such a, it's so fun, you know. When you first, you undoubtedly have this, have had this experience with your sister, and and it was one of the fun things about being courted by different labels, is to make you kind of you know form connection with them as a kind of cultural entity as well as like a business entity that take you in um, to like the closet where all the uh, all the records that they've ever you know made for many many years or everything that's in print is there in a room and they're like if there, is there anything in here that you'd be interested in and I mean I my my uh, record collection is still you know chock a block with raiding uh, record store closets <laughs> or record company closets I should say. That's awesome. You must have been, Ryan, you must have, your sister must have done that for you. Did she ever take you into the closet? Where did she work? What label did she work at? She was at Capitol, but in the New York office. So not not close enough? Were you uh, Were you out west at that time, so you couldn't quite access it? Yeah, like if she had worked at the Capitol Records building in Hollywood, I'm sure I would have gone many times, but... Um, because she was in the New York office, I never got to fly out there to go raid the record closet. Boo. <laughs> but, you know, I did get like stuff in advance. Um, yeah, I remember, you know, being the cool kid in the school who had, you know, the new Foo Fighters album a month before it came out. That's a, that's a pretty, that's a, you're a pretty cool character. If you had that record, that record was, uh, I mean, was so influential too. You know, the uh, the first one, thinking of the first one in, in particular, but all of them. Yeah. You know, so I knew what Everlong was before the rest of the world, and <laughs> that was pretty cool. Could you sense that it was a hit? It was my favorite song on the album, like, yeah. first time through. I'm always envious of people who have the capacity to kind of, like, identify the, the hit songs. That's never been my strength. Well, I... I've identified many of your songs as songs that should be hits that people listen to. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Man, I remember the first time listening to uh, Feeling Strangely Fine and being like, you know, front to back, this is like an amazing album. That one, I have to admit, I, I had I had quite similar feelings about. I, did, I, I knew it was a really, really great record. I, d- I don't know if I necessarily realized that... Um, that closing time was was everything that it turned out to be. I don't think anybody could have could have imagined that things might have gone that way for any anything that you're involved with ever. I mean, that song it's just like it is uncanny. It's just like 
evergreen. It's crazy how how it just it keep kind of keeps popping up in the cultural machine. It obviously it's captured people's imagination, but I really I did know that was a, a solid record, and I had a couple of friends who were like, "Dude, this, this is like this is this is a smash," you know. I was like, "Really, really? You think so?" I was surprised FNT wasn't bigger, and I thought that song was such a great introduction to your sound. Yeah, we all thought so too. You know, that was a, that was a, always the one that kind of like got over when we were when we were playing live and stuff. But you know, it's like there's so many different things have to happen in in order for a song to kind of land in that in that position where it, it captures people's imaginations. You know what I mean? It's just so many things have to happen, and it just didn't quite all click together with that song. Like it's a song that kind of really showed me like how full of a sound you can do with the three piece. Yeah, well, definitely we could kick up quite a racket. That was a that was something that we we could do. We got real good at that um, from you know performing a lot. You know, we got really good at 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 kind of making a, making a big noise. <laughs> Yeah, when you guys play that live, it's uh, you guys kind of kill it. I, I love I love rock trios, and I, I just love rock music. Period. I just I, I just rock music is just so freaking awesome. I just love playing rock music. I love listening to rock music. <laughs> it's just like I feel like I've been kind of rediscovering that a little bit during COVID times. Um, just kind of going through my record collection and, and listening to stuff and just going like, "This is awesome!" And I love that that pure sound of like a rock trio where it's just bass, guitar, and, and drum set is really. It's just something so visceral and thrilling about it when you can really hear every element. Yeah, for sure. So did were you surprised that FNT landed on another soundtrack? Well, you, you know, I, I have to admit, Ryan, that I did not keep that very close track of like all the soundtracks that it, what it appeared in. So tell me, what what was it in like 10 Things I Hate About You or something like that? Yeah, so it pops up three years later on 10 Things I Hate About You. Now that one actually kind of penetrated uh, the mass consciousness quite a bit more than uh, Long Kiss Goodnight. And and for that I'm very glad. And I do I I do hear from people, you know, that they that that movie is it become a bit of a cult classic, I think. And so people are always like, oh man, your your song is in Ten Things I Hate About You. Yeah, and and I think you know I think there were people at MCA actually, and also music supervisors even that kind of couldn't believe that more didn't happen with um, Feeling Strange, or not Feeling Strange is fine, but with uh, FNT. And so I think they kind of kept working it a, li- a little bit longer. And so maybe it, maybe that's why it kind of happened that way. Maybe it, it was just kind of like, well, there's also this other thing that it's been out, you know, for a little bit, but it's still a great song. And, it, and, it, and it's almost as if it's something brand new because people really haven't heard it. And so maybe that's why it worked out the way it did. I don't really know the exact details of that story. You know, that would be something for our manager, a story for our manager to tell. I mean, I think it worked. I was in the car with my wife and it came on and she's like, why do I know this semi-sonic song? And I was like, it was in 10 Things I Hate About You. And she goes, oh, that's right. Well, there you go. Again, it's like, it's many streams. Was it weird to go from like a Shane Black written film to, you know, basically a teen romance or a teen romantic comedy? Who can resist a teen romantic comedy? That's that's like where all rock music should really live in a weird way. I mean, so much of so much of what you want uh, to write about and so much of like the best rock music of all time is about the feelings that you have when you're a teenager. You know what I mean? It's it's like where rock and roll lives. I mean, obviously, uh, um, there's there's I don't. I mean, I, I was going to use the word transcend. There's music, uh, rock music that transcends that. But I, I don't know. It's just uh, you know, or, or music or songs that are from an older perspective. But I I do feel like it's like the feelings and the passion and the 
excitement of life of when you are 15 to 20 is really hard to surpass in a, in a way. And uh, certainly a song like Fascinating New Thing, it, it, it does kind of, it, it does capture like something about the experience of, of having an encounter with a person who you, you, you know, is maybe going to change your life. You know, and that really is that that time. And sometimes I have thought and I don't know if this is true or not, but sometimes I've thought like you'll never be able to. I think I think there's some studies actually that that suggest this, too, is that your most vivid and deep experience of music, at least for many people, is in that 15 to 20, 15 to 25 period. And then after that, you're just constantly kind of referring back to that time. You know what I mean? Somehow you, you, it's, it's like you can't move on from it or something. I think, I think there's many people who have much more uh, rich and sophisticated experiences of music. But I think for many, many people, it may be that, that like their musical lives are live in that time, that period of time from 15 to 25 or so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that to a certain extent. Like I still will find new bands that I really like, but you know, the stuff that I was listening into high school and college and, you know, in my early, early to mid twenties, that's when, you know, I know all the lyrics and I know like all the details of like every album. <laughs> You know, right it was just a different focus back then yeah and then not only that i mean also like the you know the the time the band appeared on the you know a late show or you know or the time the band you know get getting excited about the the fact that the band was going to be on saturday night live or the fact that the band was you know had an article in the rolling stone or, or something like that yeah it's a, it's a it's a different kind of focus i guess so in 1999, you guys were also on the Never Been Kissed soundtrack. That's also a uh, romance, kind of a kind of a teen comedy. Uh, and that is that also another Drew Barrymore film. That is a Drew Barrymore film, and John C. Riley was in it. Oh, that's right. That's right. Uh, he may have had something to do with that. Who knows? He certainly. I I, I doubt that he was uh, chatting much with the. Um, uh, music supervisors but i guess we were talking before we started recording that he's an old he's an old pal from way back in the day back when dan and i were in uh, trip shakespeare we met john down in chicago where he was studying acting at the goodman school down there and a mutual friend brought him to a show and and he became he became a huge fan of uh trip shakespeare and then we've kind of stayed in touch over over the years and yeah, he might have had something to do with that. And somehow I feel like, you know, Drew, I feel like Drew Barrymore, there was some, there was something there because it did, I, she, she kind of showed up in, in weird ways in our, in our lives as a, and, in, in the life of Semisonic as a band, you know, um, she was, I feel like, was she dating somebody in Hole maybe or something like that? <laughs> I don't know. I think she was. Which I think Sounds she, about right. I think she was dating the guitar player in in Hole, maybe, and I think she was. And we would kind of we saw her at like the American Music Awards or like kind of like hung out or were kind of like parallel gambling at the you know somewhere in in Las Vegas and stuff like that. So who knows? I I, I can never tell how that stuff actually works out. But yeah, maybe, maybe she, maybe she maybe was a fan of the band in some way too. I can't, I can't say. So this isn't a semi-sonic song, but I wonder if it ever was kind of demoed as a semi-sonic song, but in 1999 for the American Pie soundtrack, there's a Dan Wilson song called Good Morning Baby. Oh yeah. That's a great one. I, I really love that song. We were, we were, I think Jake, I think that might be Jake's drumming on there. And we did go, there was a session um, down, I want to say, it might have happened in both Australia and 
Auckland, New Zealand, where Bic Runga, she's the artist who, who sings the song. And that was kind of, I think that was a very early kind of outside of Semisonic co-write that Dan did. And I think it gave him an inkling into this other realm that he would soon come to like get very busy within and yeah that that's a i really like that i really like that song i love her singing on it and i i love the vibe of it it's it i think it is jake playing drums on it i think i was but i think i was left out of that one i think it did i don't even know if it really had any bass per se i don't think so yeah that's a sweet tune and I was there while it was being recorded in Auckland. Wonderful, wonderful town to visit if you ever have the chance. I believe I saw her open for Flight of the Concords and she played it and like me and like my friend were really, really excited. <laughs> and most of I think everyone else was just like, I thought this was a comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a great little tune. I mean, it really is, you know. That's the thing about a guy like Dan. I mean He's just got so many songs in him. And, um, you know, it's like if one song works and another song doesn't, I don't think Dan gets very hung up on it. You know, he's just like, oh, well, we'll just do a different song, <laughs> you know, right. or I'll just write another one. You know what I mean? There's a, there's different different philosophies that I've seen from songwriters in, in that way. You know, there'll be other songwriters who will get really obsessed with, you know, why did this song that I view as like the greatest song I ever wrote, why didn't it like, why didn't it get over first? But there's, you'll never know why it didn't get over. There's a million reasons why it didn't get over. And there's a million reasons why a song does get over. And you just so much of it is completely beyond, beyond your control. I mean, what, what you can do is do the best job that you can in the, in the, course of writing it and then try to make sure that you record it in a way that communicates what it's about you know right you know i've seen dan do his words and music show so it just seems like you know these are like writing exercises to him well i i think they did i think in some ways the when when people started approaching him and you know, I'm 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 going to say right now, Dan, if you're listening to this or anything, I would never, I would never try to speak for Dan. All I can say is what I've observed of Dan in terms of his creative life. I don't live in his head, and I don't certainly don't speak for him. But at a certain point, people did start to kind of approach Dan in the band, I guess, to some extent, to get songs not to not to 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 get new songs songs that were created for the purpose of a movie i'm thinking and specifically of a movie called for the love of the game which is a, a kevin costner film do you know that one yep were you going to mention that i if i'm jumping ahead and and or something you know you can you can edit it differently no no we can totally jump into that so when for the love of the game when the producer approached Dan about that song or about that movie, he was like, you know, I'm looking for something that's got baseball themed. The movie is called for the love of the game, but you know, obviously don't make a song called for the love of the game. That would be stupid. And of course for Dan, that became a challenge, you know, to write a song entitled and with the chorus for the love of the game that was not stupid but that was you know was a played on the the themes that the title kind of evokes and that song is is really good in some ways i think it's probably better than the movie and kind of encapsulates you know it had, it just is full of feeling you know and I, and i and i really like it but um you know, I don't think the song or the movie really got over. So when you're asked to write a song for a movie, do they send you like a cut of it without any music or do they just say, hey, this is what we want? It's happened in different ways. There's two little regrets that I have of movies that we were offered to be in the soundtracks that we didn't 
get into. And that w- one of them is more significantly kind of disappointing to me. And that is the movie Election, which I think is so funny. I mean, I, do you know that movie? Yeah, I love that movie. I just think it is like the biggest hoot. And we were offered the script. They gave us the script. And it was in the bus while we were on tour. And it was just kind of like sitting around in the lounge, you know. It was like the script of this movie that was had not yet been made. I don't think they didn't have any, like, video to share with us or anything like that. And I read the script. And I, I mean, I laughed out. I'm, I, I'm not great at, at reading scripts and kind of getting them. Scripts are really tricky to, to read. There's so much more going on. You know, you really have to envision the, the scenes and stuff like that. When you just, when it's just the language on the page, sometimes it's really hard to get. But this thing was straight up so funny. And I said to Dan and Jake, I was like, we have to do this movie. This is so funny, you guys. We really, it's a, this is really going to be a good one. And we dropped the ball somehow. It didn't happen. I think no one else ever found time to actually read the script. It just couldn't get any momentum. And for me, that's a sad, a sad thing because then seeing the movie, I was like, oh, we would have been perfect in this. And not only that, I can watch that movie as many times as as you might care to mention, and I, I'll laugh every single time. I just think it's so funny. <laughs> and then the, the other, there was another movie when we were making Feeling Strangely Fine that got offered to us, and I want to say it was like Little Criminals or something like that. They somehow got a hold of like a mix of a song that didn't end up appearing on the record called uh, Liar. But it didn't get onto the record, but they used it for the opening credits of this movie. And it was, oh, it, it was so great. It just sat in so great. And the movie came out, it, it was it was pretty good. Man, that opening credit scene using that song Liar, which I think appears maybe in the CD reissue of possibly the CD reissue of Feeling Strangely Fine, or maybe yeah, I think it's song. Beautiful Liar. No, that's a that's a different song. Um, a different one? The there's a, there's a song there's a song called I'm a Liar, I'm a Liar, and then there's a song called uh, Beautiful Regret. Those are two different songs. Be- Beautiful Regret could be a really good movie song if somebody wanted to kind of grab it. I sing that one uh, actually, but. I'm a liar is someone kind of, I'm trying to remember now. I want to kind of dig around and search out what the little, little something or others, little, not criminals. Uh, Wasn't it cruel intentions? Cruel intentions. Yes. How did you know that? Is it your business? to know? No, no, you you mentioned it in uh, our our email correspondence. Oh, that's right. I did go di- I did go dig it up in our and when you were we were talking about this in the emails. That's right. Cruel Intentions, a movie I never saw. I only saw the opening credit sequence with "I'm a Liar" against it, and it was it was riveting <laughs> for all a minute and a half of it. <laughs> yeah, I have that reissue with the uh, the bonus songs. I just don't have it in front of me. Yeah, I don't did did I'm a liar make it on there? I want to say it did. Yeah, I th- I thought that was a real that was a rock and throwdown. I thought, but I I I think you know Dan Dan felt like it wasn't really it didn't f- quite fit with the rest of the record, which is is true. You can it's undeniable that it, it was kind of an outlier, and I think in a kind of a heartfelt record of kind of truth telling. <laughs> <laughs> to have a, a song called I'm a Liar maybe subverts the whole project to some extent. Yeah, so Long Way From Home, I'm a Liar, Beautiful Regret, and Making a Plan are the four B-sides oh, that are included on the three just, issues. Four great tunes, too. I, lo- I love each of those in their own way. I mean, how did they even find that song to cut the uh, credits? I don't know. Well, we were all pretty excited about that song because it was really different. Uh, it was a different kind of song for us. And it sounded, the the track 
the instrumental track was really thunderous. And um, I think the producer, Nick Lane, was really excited about it. And in fact, I'm not even sure Bob Clearmount never mixed it, but Nick produced a really great mix of it. And I think our A&R guy, he was pretty excited about it too. And so it's quite possible that, you know, when he visited uh, Minneapolis uh, during the course of of our making um, making the record, he may have left with that song and kind of presented it to um, the powers that be at the label to say, listen to how the record is going. Here's what the guys are up to, you know, and then it might have kind of found a music supervisor or something. Yeah, I'm always curious when, you know, B-sides end up on a soundtrack, like, you know, how they got access to it. it like, it makes sense when a soundtrack supervisor says, hey, I want to use singing in my sleep because you know they probably listen to the album right when you know a b-side shows up i just kind of wonder how that conversation happens a lot of the music supervisors you know they're they're very devoted consumers of music and they want to be absolutely up to the minute and they want to be the biggest fan of, of whatever. And so having that kind of access and uh, familiarity, even with stuff that's kind of off the beaten path, that just, that's just like makes their brand that much more valuable. You know what I mean? Right. Cause it's not like they're just saying like, Hey, why don't we use this band's hit song in our movie? It's like, look at, here's a song that's not their hit song, but it's an amazing song and it really makes sense in our movie and it'll make this scene really cool. And wouldn't it be exciting if we kind of made this song get over independent of anything that the, that the label did, it just gives them more kind of cultural power. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Your B-side over my head showed up on the summer catch soundtrack. Oh yeah, that's right. That song. Yeah. I I got I haven't thought about that one for a long time. Yeah, that we, we recorded that I think with uh Mark Ender when we were kind of in the very kind of preliminary stages of recording uh, All About Chemistry. Yeah, that's a great song. Yeah, when I listen to that song it sounds not quite done. But yeah, it, it it is a really good song. Like I can understand why it doesn't fit on the album, but I like the song. <laughs> I don't even really know if Over My Head was even really considered in the context of All About Chemistry. I'm not sure if it necessarily was. No, oh, so it just might have been a one off from a different session. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I think, the, I think you know, Mark Ender, who had been like a producer, worked with uh, Madonna. I think he produced that. And then I think he produced um, She's Got My Number, I think. And then that, that was it. I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay. You guys have a song on the Friends TV soundtrack or one of the, the many Friends TV soundtracks that, that they created but it's like a different version of delicious, which has some live recording within the song. Uh, I, th- is that the version of the song that we recorded with, uh, Jack Joseph Puig? I think it might be. I think so. Yeah. We kind of went back, but that was a, that was a song that we, we all f- were sure was, a hit. You know what I mean? We were just, we, I think even maybe even as certainly as much as fascinating new thing, we thought delicious was going to get over, but it, it just, uh, it didn't. And then, and then even when we, when we tried it again, it still didn't. So I mean, it, it, it made a very compelling case for itself that it was not going to get over, you know, but it's definitely a live favorite. Oh yeah, definitely. It's super fun to play. It's super fun to play live. And I mean, I think it, in in a way, I mean, 
it was like a, it was kind of an important song for us as a as a live song because you know i mean jake's drum beat is like so freaking undeniable you know and also it was kind of it showed a way in terms of like a production process for us that was you know was really successful for a period of time i think dan kind of Dan, I mean, this is not the version that you're referring to uh, now, not the movie version, but like the demo version and the Across the Great Divide version, excuse me. Um, we, we Dan kind of sketched out the song and made a very, very rough demo. And then he left to go to... Um, spent some time with his wife in Guam, I think, or something like that. He, he left. And Jake and I were kind of left to kind of like work on the song and kind of like make, make the, uh, something out of it. And it was a really fun and successful kind of um, production process where we, we kind of learned a lot about how to use a, a k2000 sampler in the course of making that demo and and it 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 made that song really thunderous and exciting and and rich in 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 a fun way and uh and dan came back and he was like oh dan this is this is really good and then we were we started we were performing also performing the song with like a hip-hop group in in uh, minneapolis which was which was also really I mean, to me personally it was very exciting and I think it was really exciting to our audience too because it's just there's always that dream of like um, you know kind of an integrated group in some way and I think I think people did find that pretty exciting in the in our live sets. Yeah, it sounds really cool. I wish I was able to see that. Yeah, it was it was really it was really cool. It was definitely it, you know it was early days, but it, it's like. Yeah, it felt like we we're charting a, a slightly different, you know, slightly different course, you know, than, for example, Trip Shakespeare had. Right. And I think especially, you know, in the mid 90s, in this post grunge era, you know, it was kind of kind of jarring in a good way to hear, you know, something so funky out of you guys. Yeah. And, and kind of and kind of light and sexy. Yeah, I I, I, I liked I really liked that song for that. So is it kind of cool that you guys are associated with like friends and, you know, some of these really big shows of the nineties and the two thousands? Please. Yeah, of course. It's awesome. I mean, that those, the, I mean, friends is like, I mean, you know, sick. It's, it, it's great. I, I remember when we were mixing feeling strangely fine, Courtney Cox, came over to the Bob Clear Mountains place. He's like friends with Bob's wife. And she sat and lis- she sat and listened with us when we listened to the whole record for the first time. And wow. she sat and listened to the whole thing. And it was the first time we had heard the whole thing kind of sequenced. And it was it was really interesting and weird, but also kind of great. You know what I mean? She was there and listening and, and, um, and when it was over, she was like, this is, she, she was so complimentary and, um, kind. And, and, uh, I, I remember she said, how did you guys, how did you guys know? And I, I thought that was really an interesting, strange kind of comment to make because it felt it felt like um, very. It it, it 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 made me feel like we'd really landed on something, I guess, in a way. You know what I mean? It's like it. it she felt like seen by the music. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would have just. Said- probably made a dancing in the dark joke well that, that i'm I, i'm sure that it was perhaps it, it had to have been mentioned because that that all happened in the twin cities of course oh wow that video was was recorded at the civic center in saint paul oh that's hilarious yeah 
you know, closing time was this huge smash for you guys. It's shown up in so many different places. Um, do you have like a favorite place or a favorite show or a spot where they've used that song? Well, I mean, definitely the office. That was the thing where it, it just, I mean, you know, where it we came around again and it was like, wow. You know, because just because that, I, I think that show is, 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 is quite wonderful. And, and even at the very end, it, it still kind of was great. You know what I mean? Even as they made a decision that they had done all they, they could really do with the show, it was still really funny and, and great. And so appearing in that kind of send off, that felt, that felt pretty meaningful. I, I guess I have to say. Um, but I know there's been a, there's been quite a few other spots where it's appeared. I mean, because it's it's kind of perfectly appropriate for for that feeling every time. You know what I mean? It right. always it kind of it it kind of always works in this weird way because it's so. Uh, I mean, there's it's it's very definite, but it's also very open. You know, right. So my friend Nicole, who kind of co-hosts the show with me every now and then, she goes, oh, you're interviewing one of the guys from Semisonic? I have a question. And I said, is it whether that song is about having a baby? The answer is yes. <laughs> and she goes, oh, okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it is also about that. I mean, that was, that, was a big, that was a big deal, you know? I mean, you know, Dan's wife uh, was very pregnant. You know, as that song was being was being written, yeah, yeah. I feel like that story has come up a lot recently, at least out here in California. I don't know. One of the morning shows was like, "Did you know that closing time is about having a baby?" Yeah. Well, I mean, God, I mean, there it, it, it's about so many things. I mean, it certainly has been a part of a ton of graduations, but it's about any phase of life coming to a conclusion, another phase beginning. And there's, let's be honest. I mean, aside from dying, I suppose, but um, you know, the, the moment, I don't know if you have children or not, but basically the moment that you become a parent, there is no more monumental uh, opening and closing, you know, or closing and opening that will ever happen to you in your life. Every, everything changes in that moment for yeah, sure. It's very true. Um, so I, I think Dan was, Dan was definitely aware of that. I mean, it certainly it's come to mean it's come, it is, it has it always meant that I think it did mean that when he wrote it, these things were in his mind, but the thing that he said to Jake and I, when we played the song for the first time at the 400 bar in, in Minneapolis, he, he, not, not that night, but prior to it, when we learned the song, he said, this is going to be, now we're not going to have to always close the set with, if I run, this is going to be our new song for closing the set, you know? Um, because it, we we always were having to close the set with "If I Run," and and indeed, closing time <laughs> became very very useful in that in that way. And I mean, he really that is a way that Dan does think about about music. He does think about like how it fits, and I think that's why he's such a successful songwriter. Quite honestly, because I think he do, he can not, he can do that not only with a song in terms of like how it fits in a movie, but I think he can also think about a song in terms of how it fits in an artist's career. You know what I mean? I, I think that you can certainly say that um, in terms of like his, his co-writing with uh, the Dixie Chicks, for example, their career was in complete and utter turmoil because of this um, falling out that they had had with the country music establishment because of their, um, you know, expressing their political views, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I think Dan identified not ready to make nice as like, this is the song that you should focus on. This is the quality. This is the quality that the guy has. He has a real uh, unbelievable and very special and unusual knack for 
sensing stuff like that. And it is a, it's a real gift to be able to work with somebody who has that capacity because it, it, it finds expression in all sorts of ways in, in terms of his artistic life. And, and it's really fun to, to engage with that, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I think I went to one of his shows and he brought out Natalie from the Dixie chicks. I guess they're just the chicks now. Yeah. Right. And uh, she was talking about how when he presented that, um, you know, the song almost kind of wrote itself. Well, isn't that funny how it seems like he can keep uh, doing that? You know what I mean? I, I mean, you, you, the, the songs don't write themselves. <laughs> yeah. I, I hate to tell I you. They did. <laughs> I hate to tell every, everybody, you know, um, but I mean, <laughs> Dan is a finisher. He is great at that. And you can almost feel like it's finishing itself. But what's actually happening is uh, somebody really smart is uh, applying themselves very steadily to it until it's done and it almost feels like it wrote itself. Coincidentally, when I reached out to you about doing this podcast, because I am just a fan of your music, uh, you had mentioned that you were working on some film related stuff as well. Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, that my, my buddy with his Dust of Sons project, I'm still looking for licensing opportunities for that because it really is amazing music and would it, it would be, you know, Wes Anderson, if, if you're listening, there's this group called the Dust of Sons and we really should be in your next movie because it's the music is kind of perfect for any number of scenes and uh, that you might care to mention in a Wes Anderson film. But one kind of fun project that my group, the new standards has done over the last couple of years is um, we've been kind of going through and, and uh, kind of selecting our favorite movie scores and doing shows of all movie score songs and also not songs uh, just settings and and themes and stuff like that and there's so much great stuff it really does make the thing of like just taking a random song and just plugging it in to a movie seem incredibly lame you know and very kind of not artful when you hear these brilliant you know, soundtracks. Like I'm thinking of Nina Rota or Burt Backrack. In this project, we've we've got actually several things from, uh, you know, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, you know, Not Going Home Anymore and, and Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. And there's just such great songs and they're, they're created for these, for these movies, you know, as like standalone pieces and they're, and they're just so freaking brilliant. Yeah, they're just so great, and and also the stuff that's just like incredibly evocative, like the um, the love theme from Chinatown, or just like the various themes um, in, in you, any Fellini movie that you care to mention, or The Godfather, or another great Nina Rota uh, soundtrack. There's so much great movie music out there, and it's so fun to play. It's so rich. It is so rich. And so that's that's been a very fun project, but it's a di- you know it's a different thing. It's a different thing than just like the pure song thing. I mean, I love I love movie musicals and stuff like that. And and you know sometimes a song can really kind of be perfect in in a in a film. You know, I mean, think of like the end and Apocalypse Now, or there's there's you know many examples of of that sort, I suppose too. But um, it it is cool to have the score be actually really memorable and not just a sequence of just like pop tunes that are kind of just kind of placed in in to kind of make the movie have a zuzz and excitement. I was thinking about the first, in advance of our conversation today, I was thinking like the first time I ever really noticed music in a movie and that it like really had an impact on me. And you know what it was? It was The Sting. Isn't that funny? Oh, wow. Do you remember that movie at all? Yeah. Okay, so, and that was that was like 
classic American music of the period. And the movie is so vivid and co- and those guys, obviously, Paul Newman and, and, and Robert Redford are so cool and who wouldn't want to, to be them, you know, and that movie. And then it's all set against this great ragtime music that basically nobody had thought of for 70 years or something like that, or maybe 50 years or whatever, since that music had been composed. And it like, it made that music come alive for a whole new generation of listeners. And in some ways for me, that, that music made jazz accessible to me. You know, when that, when that movie came out, I, I loved it I loved the music so much. I became so interested in Scott Joplin. And then I went and saw Gunther Schuller and his orchestra play on two different occasions uh, with my parents in the, in the Twin Cities. And then I got, you know, records of, um, you know, Joshua Rivkin um, playing those old, uh, those old rags. And as and then my parents identified that I had this interest in this music, and they got me the the Smithsonian collection of jazz music, and and it changed it totally changed my life. And and I you can I can definitely draw a straight line from that change in me to that movie, The Sting, and and to that music that was chosen for the for the movie so it's it's amazing the power that uh, a movie soundtrack can can have over over the people who see those films yeah absolutely um and that's you know a big part of why i do this podcast because i feel like you know they can have such a huge impact on people's lives you know and sometimes in ways like they don't even understand yeah, I think that's. I mean, uh, uh, that's. I, I I completely agree. It's can. It's like it's very mysterious the way these things can uh, act on each other. I, I sometimes I think the 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 uh, the picture can make you more susceptible to the music, or maybe vice versa. The the two things, if they're if they're carefully you know put together they can they can be the more more than the sum of the parts yeah for sure and that was great thank you so much for doing this people will be able to find months and hicks party supplies on all streaming services or you can buy a physical copy as well yeah it's out there uh, you can follow john at mun songs on twitter indeed and you can follow all the different projects he's working on. And hopefully we'll see a Semisonics tour soon. Uh, well, I'm, we, I'm, we're at least going to get get a couple of shows out there. I, I, we've, we've, got a, we've got a whole LP's worth of tunes that we've, uh, that we've got ready to mix at this point. So it's, it's pretty uh, – it's, it's actually it's quite exciting times for the Semisonic crew. Oh, oh perfect. Thank you so much. Right on, Ryan. Take care. All right. You too. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Soundtrack Your Life. Make sure to visit our website, soundtrackyourlife.net, where you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too.